Absolutely. Absolutely. So I am not a computer scientist by training. I've got other degrees, but nothing ever really. I, I, I just never had an opportunity or a need um, to, uh, to do any coding. I was always practicing law or building spreadsheets or selling companies or buying companies or starting funds or whatever. And, you know, doing that, I sort of stumbled, you know, I, I, I had a you know, need to keep track of a lot of stuff. You know, there, there were contact managers out then, out back in the day. This was, you know, when um, we were transitioning from DOS to Windows 3.1, if I can date myself. And, you know, nothing was really getting it done. And so in the day, Lotus approach was pretty much head and shoulders above everything else. And so I just built my own and sort of semi-normalized it. And the, the uh, Lotus approach macro language was tremendously robust. I mean, it, put, it puts uh, access to shame, frankly. And so there was never any reason to code there. But IBM bought Lotus and, and discontinued support for the app. And so the writing was on the wall. And at that point, access was the only game in town. So I um, jumped made the leap. Bear in mind, this was a production database. And so I had to jump through some hoops. Uh, even just getting the data in was something. At that point, I had had no exposure to coding whatsoever. I didn't even know what a development environment was or what it was used for. I, you know, write code, great, you know, where? <laughs> and so I think I faced the problem that a lot of people face, which is that, you know, they're, you know, the, you know, they're not dummies, but they just can't find the honor. You know, somehow I had stumbled across, though, a um, Microsoft introduction, introductory sort of primer on VBA. And so I just started in on that. Um, got Crystal Long's tutorials, read what I could, what little I could understand of um, Alan Brown's work, got on to utter access and anybody knows who, what my handle is there, can go and find a whole bunch of really stupid questions. And, you know, so I finally got this, this thing going bit by bit. And you know, I didn't have any coding skills at all, but, you know, bit by bit, I found my way. Uh, but I was still relying extensively on macros for everything. I think um, what you'll see, this is actually the production database. But to, just to give you an idea, these are the forms. And there's a table behind each one of those, keeping track of quite a bit of stuff. And it just got to be so unwieldy. So, um, you know, I kept beating my head against the whole idea of class modules. And I just hadn't had enough training, really, to have everything click. But, um, knew I needed to do something. And somehow I stumbled across, I think someone on Utter Access put me onto it, but um, a very obscure small set of articles by John Colby, who as far as I can tell was a prominent developer, may still be, but was a prominent developer in the early days of Access, may have written one or two of the, the third party manuals for it uh, or co-authored it. And he explained class modules and the whole notion of the with events statement in a way that I could finally get my head around. I went through his code samples literally line by line and word by word and figured things out. And he, and so what he talked about is uh, to a large extent, the basis of what I started with here. So without, further ado, let me just sort of wander into this. And so what this looks like, basically, is an object framework that when you open a form, it opens, it binds itself to a form wrapper that in turn instantiates and binds a set of control wrappers. And then the form wrapper goes on to sync the form's close event to self-destruct itself, and then in so doing, all the, all the control wrappers. So this, this framework will just spawn itself and then collapse into nothing 
as the forms are open and closed. So the way that happens is, let's take this for example. For most of these forms, this is the extent uh, of the module. All we do is declare an instance of the class and the form binds itself to this property of the class. And that's where things get off and running. So what we see here, this is the product of a lot of work, but so apologies for things seeming verbose. What we have here is the binding procedure where we set this, where we set the class property, do some minor configuration, basically just inserting event procedure on these event properties. And I should credit Mike Wolf, by the way, for this. This is a, a crib of a, of a um, helper function that he wrote an article about. So full credit to him for that. That's just a, a convenience function uh, that helps, uh, to helps to do this. We do, for main forms, do a little bit of configuration here. I've been fiddling with col colors lately, so, um, and then handle subforms. And then we go on to iterate the forms controls collection. We go through, and so what happens is that I then go on to bind various types of controls to control wrappers that are that, that I've created for each of those. And then I've got a small bit of just sort of form configuration stuff here. So like this is the only way here to persist a default form order by. I've discovered be that as it may. Um, so then we go to, for example, the um, combo box wrapper. It looks identical. Now, in the course of things, I've you know, standardized things. This is the same as before. This initialize the constructor is practically identical among all of these classes that I'm talking about. Get into that a little bit more. Termination is also identical. There's a, some a lot of standard error handling and debugging stuff that is identical. And I've, I've factored out a lot of stuff to other procedures. And then one thing that I think is terribly important is to test whether these properties are set and also to, um, to make use of a, um, an instance counter. So here, this is a public variable on it in a um, global, in a standard module that I use. And this um, helps me track here whether everything's cleared up. A lot of people think that just closing the form will cause iUnknown to handle the garbage handling and just neatly tidy things up. But um, as we'll see, as we get into this a little bit, there are some certain circumstances where that's not always the case. And you get into something that isn't quite technically a race condition, but a lot of times references to the form can be destructed uh, before all of the control references are destructed with a consequence that access will, will crash. So what I'd like to do with the, um, with the control wrappers, which loosely speaking, um, for, for present purposes, are the combo box wrapper and the text box wrapper. These basically just configure the, um, configure the property in the same way. One of the things that I found is necessary is also to bind the parent of the control for different reasons. In the case of the text box, it's because that bears on form filtering. And in the case, of the combo box that bears on its ability to pass the parent object to the um, filter class that I implement, which I'll be describing in a little bit. And then we go on to sync a variety of events, double click for monitoring, a little bit of stuff handling, date incrementing, date increments, some code for the for the, uh, the date increments, and then the navigation method. And then here you see, in the case of the combo box control, um, or the combo box wrapper, you end up configuring all of the 
controls in this fashion. I'm not convinced I'm going to keep it here, but that's what I'm doing for now. Then again, we see that we are um, syncing events. Again, here, double click goes to the navigation procedure. Other things for um, you know common configuration elements that you really want to have for anything, and other things like this to um, you would want to have or mostly want to have for any combo box. And then here we have the navigation. And so what we see here in the in the object framework is the upshot of all of this is that we have, with three classes here. No, you know, not counting the more obscure classes like for tab controls. In three classes, I've configured nearly all of the objects in the database. The downside is that with three objects, I've configured nearly all of the objects. <laughs> and so, um, as, as I discovered, um, this exposed some inconsistencies with my naming convention because what you'll see is. As I get into the function, if you want every navigation from every control to perform the same in every case, you have to have a lot of the same references. And you also need to have references to a lot of the same kinds of, of objects. And you have to have destinations that exist, for example, for navigation. And so what you'll see here is that this navigation code doesn't really make many references to, to any particular thing. What that looks like though in practice is that if you're gonna have standard methods, you need to have not only standard naming, but also a standard object set. So what I needed to do was to rena start renaming things. The naming convention that I use, I started out, I had started out just from the outset using Lazinski rhetoric because it was clear, easily understood. What I quickly came to understand was that if I wanted to standardize navigation and filtering, in other words, to encapsulate those methods in their respect, these two respective um, object wrappers, that I was going to need to standardize the names. And I was also going to have a standard object set. And there are several things that I found. Um, first of all, the stem of the object name is has got to be the entity that it's implementing, for example. So for example, we see, so for, for address, for example, it will be, form address, there'll be a text box with the primary key. Actually, in this particular case, I don't have a good example of that, but if I go down to this is. So this is interesting because it's, it's also a, um, it exhibits some, something else. So first of all, the stem of the name is the entity sector. There's an entity field that is named after the entity. There is a text box with the um, PK. And for cases where there's a, a self-join, as is the case here uh, with sector, there is a, um, a foreign key that uses the same format um, in each case. So there will be a super project, there will be a super party, and so forth. Um, there also will be a standard set of queries. And in the case of each entity, you'll see there are two forms for nearly every one. So what we'll see is we'll have an entity form with the sector, which is curious. And 
Okay, that explains it. And then we have a continuous forms version. This will give you a good sense of what some of the na navigation is. If I want to go to education, well, let's go. Let's go to my sector. Let's talk to banks. Let's say we want to have a look at bank holding companies. I just double click on that and I go to the sister form. Okay, and this gives me a list of the commercial banks. So if I want to go to, for example, to be topical, First Republic closed this week. Here we have, we open this form. We just navigate by clicking on that combo box. As of Monday morning, new owner, we go to here. If I want to go find some other parties, double click on that. And I open the firm dialog unsorted. If I enter Chase in the search box, which by the way, Focus went to automatically when I switched to that, you can go back to JP Morgan Chase, find its subsidiaries, navigate to First Republic. Go back to bank holding companies. And there we are, that's the navigation that we see. And that's all implemented using these two procedures. And so naming here is N for, for navigation and then sister to go to the sister form and N for navigation and then combo for being a combo box. So one of the, the key upshot, I should, oh, one other point here. I use Lazinski Reddick, but with extensions. But the reason for those extensions is that they anticipate code. Part of the reason why, for example, I have this trailing C is, is, is to distinguish this form as continuous forms. Okay, so what that means is there's a bunch of coding in here, but what this does is to essentially inspect the control, derive its entity. So if I'm clicking on text box sector, Go back to bank holding companies to illustrate this. So this is a text box. It's the entity text box. It is table sector, field name sector. If I double click on that, what the procedure will do is it will look to the name of the object. It will derive its entity, and then it will construct the destination form name from that and then navigate to it. In the case of a in the case of a combo box, it does the same thing, but the the entity will vary as between a combo box and, and a text box. But here I'm going navigating up the self join. And then back, then this way. So in all of these cases, what we're doing is we're looking to usually the name of the object. The upshot of that is that what you're doing 
is that if you then add just a few simple string procedures, your object names become parameters. You don't need to do anything else. I, I really love the, um, the capital C is the suffix to indicate a continuous form. That's really nice. Makes it quite obvious. You know, I just came, you know, it just came up off the top of my head. But but thank you. Yeah, it, it, it helps a lot because you can, it's really easy just to inspect that or inspect for that or to add it or delete it, as the case may be. You also need to have a standard object set. So here again, I illustrate the concept of, of the naming convention. So for a table, I will name it after the entity. There'll be the PK will always have this form. The super PK, the, 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 the parent uh, for self joints will always have this form. There will always be an entity field. There will always be an entity form. There will always, in single form view, there will always be one in continuous forms. There also will be a subform. Always in continuous forms view, so I don't append a C in that case. There will always be a CBO for the entity ID uh, for the PK, which typically will appear where that is a foreign key. There will be a text box with a PK, and a text box for the entity. There will also be standard queries. The entity query I define as a global master query that includes all of the fields of the table and uh, of, of the the entity table and all of the fields of tables, uh, the lookup tables, where there's an F, where there's a foreign key. Um, and then there's also, this is, again, this is my nomenclature, a row source query for the entity combo box. There's also a standard uh, row source query that applies to every entity. Now, I, I would hasten to say that depending on the data set, the form of that query can vary significantly one to the next. But here you see all of these combo box row source queries that I've constructed over time. And then I have these, these sort of master queries that just, I mean, it's everything but the kitchen sink. I haven't looked at this for a while, so I, I can't both, I can't talk much about that. But the, but the point being, that these global master queries then are an excellent foundation for more refined um, queries built on top of them, if you will. So if we look, we can we can look at the we look at the form wrapper. It's fairly vanilla. Um, all it really does, I mean, the constructor here really just has a little bit of deep, you know, setup code for the de for debugging um, and error handling, does a little bit of stuff to set up error logging and also garbage, uh, also um, instance counting and sets a, uh, a class variable um, that'll be used elsewhere. Um, but also, and also sets a local display name that then is, is reflected here in, you know, debug code for different situations. The destructor uh, does several things. It, this is how the control wrappers are persisted. Here we see as we're creating, we're iterating the bound forms controls collection. And by control type, we're going through and setting, assigning each control to its appropriate control wrapper. If we didn't do this, in other words, add that object re reference, to a, a class collection, then as soon as this procedure went out of scope, all of those control wrappers would 
would destruct because those object references would go out of scope. This persists those object re references for the life of the class. So then we see when we destruct the class, we set that collection to nothing. This collection holds the only object references to these control wrappers. And so doing this then is how all of the, this whole structure of control wrappers then collapses. And form is, is the bound form. It's the only reference to the form. What triggers this all is this. This is where the class reaches into the code behind module. And we see here, we've declared this variable as public for just this reason. So that the class syncs the form close event. Don't need a form close event here in the form behind. But here, because this is, um, and this is declared with events, we're able to sync the form event so that when it closes, it destructs the class itself. So then destructing the class then goes back to this destructor, winds up the only form reference, the only object references to controls and winds up the only object reference to the form. We confirm garbage collection just in case. And then memory is clear. And so, so again, this just covers what we talked about just now. It will derive the entity usually when the entity is bound. We'll also bind the parent object because that's important for navigation or, or, well, it's important for filtering. It encapsulates the navigation procedure as we discussed. And then it goes on to bind the filter class. In the case of combo boxes, what I decided to do was to encapsulate all filtering in a single class. This class has, will bind combo boxes, text boxes, and the parent form, all three in one. The reason I decided to do this is because there are some um, procedures, some methods that I use um, in generating the filters that um, that are common, and I, I could I could sprinkle those into standard modules and so forth. But just my take was that it was probably just easier to put that all into one class. Where there's overlap is in the helper procedures. Otherwise, there is excuse me virtually no overlap between the events uh, uh, that are sunk uh, as between these those two. So there is there is little prospect, no prospect of conflict in these cases. And so what we see is that we'll have you know, identical initial, initialization and termination code. We'll have a property for the bound combo box if we happen to bind a combo box. We'll have a property for the bound text box if we're binding a text box. And in each case, we bind the parent. In the case of combo boxes, we pretty much want list filtering for every combo box. So, no, I forget where I do that. There we go. So we essentially unconditionally bind every combo box to the filtering class because we pretty much want list filtering everywhere it goes. In the case of text boxes, we only do so conditionally for search controls. Now, one of the things that I do for search controls is um, to name them uniquely. So for example,
here we see the name of the search control has the same prefix every time. And so we only bind controls so named to the filter class. So we have this prefix in every case, but then we also have this. That actually is the field name that we're searching. Again, the object name is the parameter. So better illustrated with the continuous forms view. So search, we're searching sector. So if we want to say bank holding company, see I've handled spaces here. It filters as we go along. And all we have to do is navigate to that. And there we go. To show you how that works, Let's look at this form. Okay, so you see here, there are no search, search controls. We've got the, this is the continuous forms version of, uh, for the city entity. We've got the, the text, the entity text box. We've got the, the, the PK text box. We don't have anything here. So if we just sort of copy that here, I'm just going to name this. Unbound. Save it, close it. Where'd it go? We're just getting goofed up on the interface, or is that not there? I don't see it. Well, it may be a transparency issue. Let's take one. See if that shows up. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a color issue. Um, so we're going to change the name here to 
reflect this field. Um, now we're going to close this. I'll reopen it. So what you've seen is all that's necessary to implement form filtering is simply to drop a properly named text box onto the form. Don't have to jump through hoops, don't have to configure every form. All you have to do is just drop the right properly named text box onto the form and you'll have, you'll be able to filter that form. Now, the algorithms are under revision in each of these cases. So again, list filtering covers all combo boxes. The way the algorithm currently works, it will search any field in the row source in the SQL statement underlying the combo box row source query. And so what that means is that um, in each, in the case of each combo box, we, so here what we do is, is we address the, the case of whether the row source query is an SQL statement itself, or if it's one of our saved combo box queries. Again, this is where the naming convention helps. All these extensions that I used, I used, I, I implemented, are intended to anticipate code. So if I have a saved row source query, and that's what its purpose is, is as a row source query, it will have this prefix. So then all I need to do, then I can I can discern that as opposed to it being an SQL select statement on its own, and then pick up the SQL statement that way. And so what that means is that in defining each of these, I also define the filter that I'm gonna apply in the list filtering. The way it works otherwise currently is that I, Use the, the, the query def, def object in DAO to pull out the, um, the fields from the query that's subject to review. I then um, later iterate through those fields if they have certain characteristics, I include them or exclude them uh, from the list. And then I construct a, um, a new. SQL statement. Using a variety of other methods here. So basically tear apart the existing SQL statement and then reconstitute it using a procedure that constructs a new where clause um, given the user input. Now, the problem with this currently is that I'm going through and iterating a couple of different collections of fields. It's, you know, it, it, it can be improved. Uh, the, other, the other issue is that um, it does not effectively filter in the case of self joins because the query def object method in the case of a self-join for each self-join instance returns table entity dot entity, for example, not table entity dot entity and then table underscore one dot entity, table underscore two dot entity as the row source query expresses the, um, uh, expresses it. And so I'm 
noodling on a couple of ways to do that. In a shortcoming of the, the uh, filtering for performs is that it, it's just a single field query. That's good enough for me for now. And so I haven't had or needed to look at that much uh, in much more detail. But Eric? yes. Um, Let's look at this. Here we've named this for searching the city. Let's search for the state. In this example, do you have the state table in the record source behind this form? I'm sorry, do I have the which? The, the state table, is that in the record source of the form? Because here we're looking at a combo box that's bound to the state ID. And we're trying to filter on the state name. Right. So okay. how is this applying that filter? I'll show you. This is what's interesting. Oh, of course, access lets you do this, yeah. So I'll tell you why. It's because of this. This syntax Look up CBO something dot field. I'm talking here about state. Effectively adds all of the fields in table state um, to the Dynaset. Um, of this form. Now the record set of this form includes only fields in this table. But by including the syntax in the order by, that has the effect of adding all of those fields in this joined in this in this um, well joined table to the data set of this form. If you stop and think of it, the object model for the form is just an object model. It isn't the code. And if we stop and think about it, Access really is a SQL engine with some VBA capability on top of it. It's one of the reasons why SQL runs so much quickly, so much faster um, than does VBA. It's because it's, it's optimized as, as, as a SQL engine. And so if we stop and think about that, we realize that underlying the form object, I mean, for starters, the form object has a record set property. That tells you that the form is not really working with the table. It's working with a record set that's generated from the table. Okay. And if you say that, it, that tells you that really the Dyna set that the form is working with is most likely the output 
of a select statement in the code underlying the form object. And if you understand that to be a, that the dynaset underlying the form is a query and that it is a dynaset and so can be changed, you can change the data, that fits. And it also explains the name of properties like order by, which matches up exactly with SQL syntax. And so what we see going on here is there's a lot more going on under the hood of the form objects than the object model itself might suggest. And also Mike Wolf commented a few weeks ago about seeing, you know, reading or hearing that Access SQL has some dozens of, of uh, functions, including the, do the domain aggregate functions that we're all familiar with, but that's only a small set. The remainder are undocumented. I think this is one of those undocumented functions or bits of syntax. Now, that's, that's really good. I never did quite understand how you could sort a form on a, an unbound column in a combo box. So in this case, the, the combo box is bound to state ID, but you can actually um, sort the form on state. Just so. Yeah. yeah. Never did understand Not how only, you could do that. Yeah, well, and the thing is, you realize that to be able to sort the form on state, as we do you know, here, right, we need to include that field. It turns out all of the fields in that table. Are, are included in, in, in this dynaset. But in order to be able to, to sort or order by this field, you need to include that in the dynaset for the form. Mm, actually, no. Like if you've got a data sheet or a, a um, continuous form and you can sort on that column without explicitly putting that in the um, the order by properties of the form, Access seems to be able to do that for you. I think it's doing it. I think it's doing exactly the same thing behind the scenes, yeah. yeah mm. the, the, the point is simply that if, if there's a dynaset, the, the, the point is if what underlies, if the data underlying a form is not the table, but a dynaset that's created by... yeah. The, the SQL statement in in the the you know C++ code yeah. underlying excellent, uh, excellent. Underlying the yeah. form. very well explained yeah. worth the price of admission yeah that, that, that <laughs> by itself is well worth it yeah so where did you find that reference how did you identify that I was early in my access journey trying to wrestle the default form sort order issue to ground because the default behavior is every time you sort the form and then close it, you reopen it and it comes back to the way you had just sorted it, not any default. Right. And I documented this extensively in utter access several years ago. But in switching into design mode, into, into design view, you know, you know, switching back and forth from design view to form view in my frustration, um, I discovered that Access had put, depending on what I had sorted by, had put strings like this into the order by property, which, and, and it caught my eye. And so I then decided to try to hack it uh, by putting something else in, and it worked. And then somehow in the course of poking and prodding, I discovered that other fields besides this one that's specified here on which to sort, that the other fields in that table also were included in the dynasect. So part of what I did was um, 
I realized was that the only, one, one of the only way, these well, essentially the only way to persist that sort order was to keep it in the tag field. And then when loading the form to um, copy that to form.order by, and then turn the order by Turn on the order by. What is this? So here, this is the only way I found to have a. Um, a default form order by. Well, I, so I've been explicitly setting the order by using a, a constant declared in the module header, where I more or less do the same thing. But you're here, you're using the tag. Yeah, okay. I'm using the tag. You can you can do it in the module header. Well, you, you can do it in the in the module header in the form behind. Um, you can't do it in a class. Mm. But yeah, but can, yeah, but either way. Um, you know, just from, from a um, you know streamlined perspective, for me, it's, it's just easier to put it in the tag, and then you know, essentially, for most um, form modules, it's listed to this. It, it it's limited to this, so I don't mm. I don't need to worry about going into the the, the form behind modules ever. Yeah, that's good. Um, and, and, you know, you can do it either way and it, it wouldn't matter, but yeah. So Eric, just to clarify, are you doing anything to the Dynaset there, um, when it loads or that's just the way it is and you're just taking advantage of it? I'm just exploiting it. I don't know how to get to that Dynaset. Um, I don't know that you necessarily want but to. Could, maybe you could put in a control, you know? Yeah, no, um, my, my, my point being that that it's just there and we haven't taken advantage of it, but you have. Is that correct? Well, I have. I don't know what... I've seen a handful of references to that syntax um, over the years. Crystal Long has made a reference once to it, um, okay. among others. And, and then the other thing that caught my eye, just the name of that... Uh, in the order by clause, if you could go back to that for a sec, in the uh, in the form design, yeah. So that that syntax, the lookup underscore CBO country, that's just the name of the control. Is that correct? It, like the lookup underscore part catches my eye as being a bit unfamiliar. So exactly. it's nothing other than the name of the control. Right, and so the the syntax seems to be. Uh, lookup underscore. Oh. Okay. The syntax is lookup underscore. And then whichever control you're, you're referencing. Got it. Okay. Okay. I, I, I understand now. Yeah. Yeah. And then. Um, and then the field on which. You want to sort in this field. I want to be careful. I don't think the field necessarily has to be in the uh, combo box row source query. I um, think it's just enough that the primary key of the table in which this field exists. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Because we're not talking about, we're not re referencing the column numbers. We're actually referencing the field name in so. the source. Just so. So having to have the primary key of that table we're looking up makes sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so with, with the PK, the, 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 code, the, the code underlying the form, object. Um, 
only seems to need that to add all of that table's fields. Mm. So then the way that you're you're building that whole clause there is you're manually going in, sorting by it, and then going into the form design to see what access did and copy that. Is that correct? What, in terms of how I figured it out or? or? Uh, yeah, uh, you know, you're building a new form. You wanna have that one sorted by all those columns that don't exist in the, in the forms record source. So you gotta discover that and, and type it somehow. So I'm just yeah. trying to understand. Yeah, right. so when I when I develop a new form, I will I will type that in manually. Okay. okay. Yeah. You know, but um, if you use the sorting you know, uh, buttons on the ribbon, for example, right, Access will place these code in this format in this property. Right. Right. Okay. Which is so what I discovered and what I went on to hack speak. manually, and then. Um, have you know exploded um, ever since? Cool. Speaking, are there any other questions? We're almost ninety minutes into our meeting time, so let's. Are there any other questions on other subjects or comments? If not, I do have one question for Eric. Mm -hmm. it, it looks to me like with this approach, you can build a standard set of forms which can serve as templates for lack of a better word. And they would carry all of the controls and uh, references that you need. Mm, I mean, you can even do things with it, like with the text box um, class, you can have that do the same thing as what conditional formatting focus does. Yeah, And you can set the background on the get focus and lost focus without having to do it for every individual control in your application. Right. It yeah, doesn't need stuff like that. You can configure every object consistently. Mm. The, the, that I was facing, I mean, you see this list of forms, right? And each one of those forms has combo boxes. And I, yeah, this, this is more extensive than when I started out, but um, every single one of those controls had a macro type to it. You know, can you imagine the brain damage? This is back when I didn't, mm. I, I didn't know how to do this stuff, and I was just trying to keep up with that. That got me to, to you know, seek out and. Um, yeah, my, my initial concern with this type of thing was that it was going to consume a huge amount of memory, but it doesn't really seem to. No, it doesn't. The only time I've had a, a problem was with the slow leak, and I think it was because I had a circular reference between. Um, the control class and the form class. Yeah. Just yeah, something you've got to watch out for. That illustrates one point that I do want to make. In the filter class, what we see is, and I made a reference to this earlier. Here. Ah, that's what I uh, wanted to know about. Yeah, so this is what I call a downstream control wrapper. The form instantiates the um, combo box wrapper and the text box wrappers, among others, right? And then those two control wrappers in turn instantiate this filter class. If I try to do this, in other words, set the references the object references that exist to those bound controls to nothing in the um, destructor up above in, in class terminate. If I try to do that here, that isn't soon enough. What happens is that access crashes. I and, I just was having access crash just randomly and I couldn't figure it out. I ended up debugging and you know, the reason for all of this logging code is because of this issue. Um, I went off and, and I, you know, access would crash so I couldn't have access to the immediate frame. I went through and, and went through event by event with every single object. And what I seem to have figured out is that in this automatic destruction, 
right? So you close the form, that causes the form wrapper to, well, you close the form, the form wrapper then self-destructs because it sinks the, the close of that. And then that wipes out the references that exist in the control wrappers to the form's controls, but it does not um, wipe, eliminate the references that exist in the filter class to those to those controls. And so what I have tentatively concluded happened is that the form went out of scope, um, but before its controls went out of scope. And I think what Access was choking on was the fact that there were persistent control references and no form controls collection for them to be in because the form had gone away. I was having a problem where I actually was trying to reference the parent form from the, um, the control classes. And so the control, the form had a collection of the um, control classes, but the class, the control classes were also referencing their parent form. And so you try and close the parent form and it kind of couldn't because it was still being referenced by the children. You tried to destroy the children and it, yeah, it all went a bit pear-shaped. Yeah, so I, I bind the parent form here. And I don't have any trouble with it. Um, that may be because in the destructor here, I clear the reference. I clear, I clear the control references, or no. Yeah, that clears references to the filter class. I clear references uh, to the text box, and then I clear, and I clear references to the parent. Um, the, the point I'm making here on the downstream class is that Is this it? No, it's down below. Um, it's simply that for them, it's important to um, clear the reference. Can't tell where I'm in. It's important to clear the reference on the parent close event. Because if I wait for the destructor, It'll be too late. You know, in your case, it might have been, you know, I'm just I'm guessing it might have been a question of where on one you were you were removing the reference. But to the point, that illustrates a problem with these these object frameworks, which is that the risk of um, persistent object references is very real. And so I talk here about lessons. Um, you know, you know, we 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 all learn this. You know, universal error trapping conserves um, conserves time, but you know, you, you can end up with persistent object references very very easily. And so it's it's um, best to destruct those references very consciously. It's also good. I found very very helpful to always remember that object references are passed by reference by default in VBA and to be and, and to recognize that there's you know quite a potential for an unintentional passback um, error there that can, that can cause problems. And so that's that's one of the reasons why you know, I, you know I'm passing enough objects here back and forth. If I don't have to, I'll try to use I'll try to pass a string instead. Um, cause that, those go out of scope, you know, pretty much every time, but object references don't.
don't necessarily. Right. So when you're creating the controls collection in the form class, right. you're passing the form to the controls classes that before you add them to the collection, you're passing that by val or by ref? Actually, it turns out, and this is something I'm, I'm, I've, I wrestled with. Um, what you see is that I do not pass the form to those controls. That's one way to approach it, frankly, is to pass that form here. Um, instead, what I do is I look to here. I derive the parent of the control and bind it that way. For better or worse. But the parent of a control isn't always the form. It can be it's the section it's in. It can or in be. the case of a label, it's the... Yeah. You notice that I, I have some conditions here for just that eventuality. Uh, okay. I've got a helper class that tests, or a helper function that tests parent type. But you're right. Yeah, the... the, the the, the parent of a control can be you know, the section. It can be a, a, a page on a tab control. Um, you know, you can go on. Yeah, this is just how I chose to skin this cat. You know, I've noodled a little bit about assigning the form to the controls in the form wrapper class. And I sort of half think I'm fully thought this through. I sort of half think that would avoid the persistent control reference issue, but I'm not certain. And I wasn't motivated enough by the question to go through the brain damage of recoding my modules. <laughs> it can be very time consuming tracking down little things like that in this. This, this is very similar to what I've been doing. It would be really nice just to do it. Time consuming, Kent. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. We're we're an hour and a half, and and I think we need to wrap it up. So what I'm going to suggest is, I, I mean, this could go on for another two hours, I'm sure. <laughs> so if you want to follow up, we should either schedule future meeting or maybe arrange for people to continue offline. What would you prefer? Um. Well, I Mm, I think offline. Take so. questions offline. Yeah. yeah I, this is always the problem. I get caught up and then I look at the clock and it's an hour. Well, we've been going for an hour and a half rather than our. No, it's eight o'clock. Yeah, hour and a half. And to be fair, I need to bring it to an end. No, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. That was wonderful. Now, if if you can put you, if you would like to follow up discussion wise, can you put your email addresses in the chat? And we yeah, are on this presentation. My email is here on the bottom. Okay. All right. All right. So. And that's a Q, not a G. Bqco.com. But um. Okay. So. So if you if you'd like to do that, I think that'd be a wonderful way to cross fertilize spark ideas. I'm interested in the idea of, of starting out with just a, a library of standard forms that you could instantiate for a new project uh, with all the classes, all the code attached to it rather than have to redo that every time from the beginning. You know, something I'm not aware of. I notice you have you know, dozens of forms. Uh, you know, I think that would make it a and I'd, I'd be interested in whether that would be a viable way to. I think it is. Um, some of that. You know, I'm, <clears throat> you know, thinking about it and starting to talk to some people about doing some of this stuff for other people um, besides myself. Um, but one of the things that occurred to me in that regard was that, um, you know, you can use user defined system tables um, 
to contain some of your, of, of your configuration parameters and just use a framework like this to implement it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So let's pursue that for a future use somewhere either offline or in a future presentation. For now, I think I'm going to stop the recording and wrap it up for today.